Hey, everybody. It is your buddy, your boy, your pal, Tommy D. Hashtag from the attic. Welcome to my attic. I mean, I've been up here now 57 days. My wife is keeping track on the calendar how long we've been uh, isolated and quarantined and, and, and stranded. Uh, a little bit of like feeling like I'm on Gilligan's Island, um, except the weather's not as nice. So I will say this, I, I have a fortunate opportunity to be connected into the nonprofit sector uh, out in Long Island and beyond. And what that does is it affords me the, uh, the pleasure of getting to connect with my friends. Um, today we have Lauren Marzo, Chief Advancement Officer of the Viscardi Center. So I put Lauren's name and things like that, very high tech, the way we're doing things these days from the attic. Um, Lauren, thank you for joining me in the attic. I appreciate you coming on the show. Um, how are you? I'm doing okay, Tommy, and thank you for having me. I love being in your attic. It's totally better than my basement, which is what you're seeing here. <laughs> I have awesome. no light. You have a lot of light. So uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this. Um, looking forward to having a great conversation today. So excited. And, and thank you for smiling because it brings a good vibes. So I love when people <laughs> smile. And hey, listen, man, I, I saw, uh, you know, I, I actually haven't watched it, but I saw that Jimmy Fallon is doing the Tonight Show like on his iPhone or something like that. This is it. The, the playing field has been leveled, I like to say. And we can all, wherever we are is, is, uh, is appropriate for, for what's going on right now. So what I like to do in these conversations, Lauren, is I like to learn uh, philanthropy and focus. This series is really all about giving an organization and giving a leader from an organization the opportunity to tell their story. So my intention is only to be a platform where we can learn about the mission of an organization, the history, what they're working on, the programs, who they serve. Uh, and then on the other side, the maybe some of the challenges they're going through or potential collaborative partners that they might be looking for. Because as I imagine it, people will be listening to learn about you, to learn about the Viscardi Center, but they're also gonna learn about how do I help? How can I make an impact? How can I add value? So from that perspective, T tell me about your story. Tell me about Lauren. You know, I, I noticed you went to Fordham University, both for undergrad. You got your MBA in marketing. Go Rams. Um, tell me a little bit about how you get from, from there to Viscardi, and, and I'll let you take it away. Okay. Well, I don't want to bore anyone, but uh, I do think I have a somewhat unique path. Um, I always loved volunteering and just giving service to others throughout my childhood. And I think a lot of kids are experiencing that these days. I think that's actually a great thing we're seeing coming out of crisis situations and really just the, the newer generations, Gen Z, um, millennials, there's a lot of giving back. And I was fortunate to have parents that taught me that at a young age. So when I graduated from Fordham, I didn't wanna go into the for-profit world. I wanted to go straight into the nonprofit world. So I worked at Fordham briefly and while I was getting my MBA, I did actually go into marketing at a publisher called John Wiley and Sons, which is a great publisher in New York. And after a while there, I, it's a wonderful company, but I felt really compelled to go back. And actually 9-11 happened, and that's probably what really compelled me to go back into the nonprofit world. I just felt that I, I had a personal mission to give back, to be a part of people giving back. And I went back to Fordham and actually my main job there at the time was to work on memorial scholarships for people who had perished in 9-11. So I worked with a lot of the families on setting up those scholarships and it was extremely meaningful. I felt that I was giving them that sense of peace that they were all looking for. Uh, it was really incredibly moving to get to know those people and hear their stories and what they went through and uh, to be a part of, of helping them find peace. So. I did that for about three years. And then I felt, again, the sense that I wanted to do more. And uh, I've always had a passion for working with people with disabilities. I worked at a camp, actually volunteered, I didn't get paid, but I was at a camp every summer as a teenager and young adult where I was working with people with pretty severe disabilities. And I was just so moved by who they are, what they do, what their talents are, their abilities. And I wanted to get back into that because you know, there's something about that that um, gave me such an uplifting feeling. So I found an organization called YAI that was looking for a development person. And I, I did that for seven years. It was uh, one of the best experiences of my life. A great organization that serves uh, 20,000 people with disabilities all over the tri-state area. 
a lot of group homes and a lot of people with autism, Down syndrome, great, great, great place. Um, and through that work, I was able to connect with the Viscardi Center. They had an opening and I jumped at it. I have now been with Viscardi for over eight years and it's a truly magical place. Um, I hope that anyone listening to this would come and visit when this whole crisis is over or you know, come and see us online at the viscardicenter.org. Check out our Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Uh, we're always posting. Uh, it is unbelievable what this place is. It's been around since 1952. Uh, many people on Long Island know it, but I think that it's still somewhat of a hidden gem that not everybody knows about. And what's so special about it, it was founded by a man with a disability, uh, Dr. Henry Viscardi Jr., born without full legs, um, really somehow rose above all of that back in 1912, the 1920s. He was able to serve at Walter Reed Hospital during World War II. Oh, and he went to Fordham, by the way. So go oh, Rams. Oh, there you go. There's he a connection. Go Rams. That's, I mean, it's sometimes you just think things are like kismet. Mm. When I found the Viscardi Center, first of all, the founder is this incredible man, and I'm about to get into more on that, but he went to Fordham, and my father used to go to the Viscardi Center in the 70s and work with Dr. Viscardi and his crew. On uh, They were a factory at the time. Yep. So um, my, own, my own dad knew Dr. Viscardi, which, you know, when I found all this out, I said, I need to work there. <laughs> I need to devote my life to making this a better organization, and it's already great. But, uh, you know, sometimes you just immediately walk into a place and feel at home. And I actually want that to be conveyed to all of our supporters and friends that when they walk in the door, they immediately feel at home. Um, how do you how do I that, Lauren? It. Lauren, how do you do that? How do you make, and now I've been on the tour. Mm -hmm. I've been fortunate. Yep. I, I don't know if we spent an hour together, an hour and a half and, and walked around and we saw uh, the setup of uh, where Dr. Viscardi's office is with the pictures yeah. and, and uh, very touching. But how, I felt like I was at home, but we're friends and, and you, you made me feel welcome. But how do you, um, how do you do that? How do you make a donor or, um, uh, or a prospective board member? How do you make them feel at home? I mean, that's a really good question because um, I think the tour is really key. And what I like to do on the tour is really introduce people to the students, uh, to the staff. You know, I know, Tom, you spent a lot of time talking to one of our occupational therapists yeah. and all of these people that, uh, that we have on staff are phenomenal. They're experts in their fields. They work with these children with very severe physical disabilities every day. And then the children themselves are phenomenal. I mean, sometimes you can't predict what's going to come out of their mouths. They're typical kids. They'll say yeah. anything that comes to their heads. But um, people love meeting them. They like hearing their stories. They like just you know, chatting with them. So I make sure that anyone who comes in the building gets the chance to really meet the people of Viscardi. And I think that's really what draws people in and makes them want to come back for more. I mean, first of all, I felt super welcome and I can't wait to come back and visit. And uh, just a quick, um, quick shout out to my cousin, Taryn Maudsley, who's a graduate of uh, the Viscardi School. Um, love you, kid. Haven't seen you in a little while. Hope all's well. Um, so the uh what was fun for me too when i came to visit um i got to hang out in the cafeteria for a little while although i think i've, I've been there a couple times because i feel like i was there another time with uh with a different gang of, of my friends um and is it coach joe am i do i have his yeah. first name right yeah he's yep. a character coach, man yeah, and coach hey, hey coach joe if you watch this you know um listen i'm serious about that basketball game and i know your your threat or your promise was that my team was going to get smoked by uh, smoke that is by your uh, your your students over there. So yeah, um, you will. You, you, yeah. no one could beat our kids. Well, uh, listen, we're up for the challenge, and um, I think nothing better to raise money than than watch a bunch of guys get beat on the basketball court. So uh, so we're willing to, uh, to to take one for the team, as they say. Um, so we got to get that on the calendar as soon as. And what we keep saying as soon as or what's going on. So let's just reference real quick. It is uh, it is May seventh, two thousand twenty. Uh, eight weeks into the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. So uh, we are certainly in a new world. Um, when when we are back to whatever the new situation is, you know, that new track, that new normal, um, I, I, we have to get out to the center. And, uh, and I'd love to do uh, do that basketball game for sure when, when and if it's appropriate. Um, so, so obviously you're passionate 
you have a deep connection to the work, but to the service work. I want to ask you a question. So um, your parents, you said, were very involved in service and you, and you saw that and, and you were aware of that. Um, how to tell me about that? Because I want to I'm a vision. I'd like to see the story. Like, what was it? Because I, I, I'm a bit involved in in service work. And I think, um, you know, I can speak personally that my kids have gravitated as young as they are, have gravitated to being involved in, in things um, from a service perspective already. Um, and I'm, I'm thrilled that, that I've made that impact on them. So I'm curious how that, how that reflected in when you were growing up. Yeah, I mean, we went to a homeless shelter pretty regularly and it was through our church, but then I also went through my um, school. And uh, so I had a number of opportunities to go there and cook meals for a um, homeless group of people in, in a shelter and get to know them. I remember seeing uh, a wide variety of people there and, and really understanding more about why they're in that situation and how they're trying so hard to get out of it. And being a part of helping them just felt so good. Um, and then, you know, also, and this is church related, but I think you can find this in a lot of different ways. Uh, there was a woman in my church who was in a wheelchair and um, kind of took me on as a, a mentor. And I really appreciated that. I don't know why she did that, but she, uh, she also helped me explore sort of um, what was going on with people with disabilities and the ADA was getting passed. That was 1990. We're actually celebrating 30 years this year. And she was uh, one of those people who was always pushing people to change and it was a good thing. So she made sure we had a ramp going into the church and a wheelchair accessible bathroom. And she kind of took me along for the ride and I learned from her why it was important to have those different uh, accessible options in place for people. And uh, I think just when you, you get to know people like that at a young age and you, you feel inspired or you feel like you learned something, you know, it stays with you throughout your life. And I, I feel blessed that I had those opportunities. Again, I people come and go in our lives for, for various reasons. And sometimes um, they're, they're friends for the long term and sometimes they're not, but they, we impact each other, man. We really truly do. And I talk a lot about two things I try to do every day. I, I try to make an impact and I try to add value. And I like, I say that, like if I say it twice a day, I say it 50, 60 times a day, you know, because I think it's, it's critical. Um, and, you know, not to get, excited about myself but I know that just some of the things I do impact other people and and literally we have that ability to change the trajectory of somebody's day somebody's career maybe somebody's life and and that's uh, that's what we are I think that's the human experience from my perspective it's it's about that it's about love it's about making those connections and it's about um, inspiring people to to serve um, so uh, the Henry Viscardi story, it, it, to me, there's so much there. Um, so tell us this story because you've told it to me. I remember walking in the door. As soon as I walked in the door, we started with the story because I'm super curious and I want to know everything. So, um, it, you know, I wrote down a couple of things, but um, it's the Viscardi network of nonprofits was first founded in 1952. And Dr. Henry, Henry Viscardi Jr. served as a disability advisor to eight presidents. So tell me that story. And I know there's an inspirational story. There was a, I think there was a, um, maybe a wealthy person or some, somebody of means that did something for Dr. Viscardi that then in turn kind of probably changed the trajectory and got this ball rolling. And I know you know what I'm talking about. So mm -hmm. can you talk about that story? Yeah. yeah. I mean, he is... I, I can't even imagine people like him existing today. He, he got so much done at a time when things were not as easy. There was no social media. There was no internet. Um, he, he just, he somehow got his message out to so many people. Um, but what he, what he did to start was actually um, serve at Walter Reed Hospital and he met Eleanor Roosevelt. And I think that was probably very life-changing as, as we talk about mentors and people who inspire you or, or encourage you along the way. He had Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> as his mentor. Uh, I don't think you can ask for a better mentor than that. Uh, it did kind of lead him towards uh, being a disability advisor to FDR and seven other presidents after him. And through Eleanor, he was also very much encouraged to start Abilities Inc., which was the original organization. And as I said before, it was a factory and they were producing parts. They were a huge operation and it's still, it's exactly where it is today. Um, 
on the corner of IU Willits Road and Searingtown Road in Albertson, New York. They employed 400 people with disabilities making parts, phone parts. That's what my father came out to buy. Airplane parts, um, you know, computer components. This was the start of the industry on Long Island, and he was a part of all of that. So it was really incredible to learn about that, and I love, love to share that because um, he was the first one to really start a social enterprise that I'm aware of. I mean, that was a true social enterprise. It was giving jobs to people with disabilities. A lot of them were veterans coming back from the war, missing limbs, having some sort of new disability, and then others that were born with their disability as well. And then he started working with the Kennedy family and employing people with developmental disabilities. So just incredible. Uh, I, I'm still completely stunned by what he was able to accomplish in the 50s and 60s. Um, and uh, I guess really to, to carry it forward, he, he moved into new areas as time went on. And today we have the school, which he started in 1962, which now has 170 students with physical disabilities. Um, uh, in many ways, their cognitive abilities are completely uh, on par or above what you see in typical schools. So we you know, make sure that they're on track to go to college, to get jobs. Uh, and then the other side of the building, we are actually training and providing jobs. So we kind of education and employment and then empowerment being at 30, that's what we're all about. Because really to have a fulfilling life, to have a meaningful independent life, you need the education, you need employment, and you need people to believe in you. So that's the empowerment piece that we really instill in everything we do. So I just think we do amazing work and I'm biased, but I hear about it from a lot of people that they're, they're pretty impressed with what we're able to accomplish and, and what our students and program participants are able to accomplish. Um, I love the three E's because anything that can be catchy like that and I can remember it, it's better for me. So it's education, it's employment, and it's empowerment. And uh, you know, equally as important, although the empowerment piece I think is super critical for all of us, um, whether you have some sort of disability or challenge or you don't, um, it's, we need somebody in our corner. We need somebody fighting for us. We need somebody pumping us up and, and giving us that, that pep talk and, and inspiring us to, to uh, experience our own greatness, whatever that may be to an individual. Um, I, I want to ask you one other question, but then I want to go back to education and employment. So um, the, wasn't there a gentleman that helped Mr. Uh, Dr. Riscardi with, with, right. the, with the legs and the, and the prosthetics and, and what did he tell him? Wasn't there like that piece? Tell yeah, me that no, story. I'm glad you reminded me because I didn't get to that part. That was okay. actually a key part of his life. That was around age 26. He had been walking around on his um, stumps. I mean, that's what he called it with special boots. And around age 26, he met a doctor who took a strong interest in him, saw his potential and found a prosthetist who would actually fit him for legs free of charge. And Dr. Viscardi said, I can't pay for this. I mean, that would have cost probably even then, this was, I don't know, the 1930s or so, the 20s. How could anyone pay for that, especially someone with limited means? And uh, the doctor said to him, if you could help one person with a disability in your life, that's your payment. I mean, incredible. And uh, he went on to help millions of people with disabilities. Isn't, <clears throat> isn't that the whole thing? Like, isn't that it? Yeah. Isn't that so one man who uh, we don't even know his name, but cha change and influence. Well, I know his doc yeah, I do know his name. You don't, I don't know his name. Yeah. Tell, tell me his name. <laughs> Dr. Let's Dr. Yanauer. Dr. Dr. Yanauer yeah. actually yeah. also gave Dr. Viscardi a place to live. So he really helped him in a number of ways. But that story, uh, and I've heard Dr. Viscardi tell it on, on film, so powerful um, that yeah one person can really change one other person's life and then it, it's like a pay it forward and then, and then it goes on to help millions of other people no no doubt about it and that's it so anybody out there uh, listening to this um, and, and trying to figure out you know does does my effort matter does my you know how I'm one person how can I make an impact well there you there's there's the answer and I will make sure that I will have the four listeners the four people that are downstairs, this, these uh, small people that live in my house, my children, get to listen to this because this stuff is what inspires the heck out of me every day, man. Because if, if you can do that and if you can make that impact, you can change the world right on. I mean, it's proven. Yeah. This is it. This is a perfect story to prove that. A big thing that I find, um, and you, you know, you, you know, my, uh, my cousin Linda, uh, she had special needs and um, she's, uh, she has passed and we have the Lindy Lou Foundation in memory of her name. Um, 
But having Linda in our lives for those 31 years made us very aware of, um, you know, going back now, you know, I'm, I'm 42, uh, Linda was, you know, she was my, my brother's age, so she would have been 39, 38, 39 right now. Um, she would have actually turned 39 in March. Um, back then, things were different. You know, I think we're more aware as a society here in the States um, of, about people with special needs, where I think 35, 40 years ago, less so. I think we've cert certainly evolved. But I've always heard, and uh, you know that I spent a lot of time in nonprofit sectors, and, and even more so specifically in, in the um, IDD area, intellectually and developmentally dis disabled areas, um, is the aging out population. So, you know, where, where somebody turns 21 and then there, this, there's no longer services for those individuals. Um, so from an education uh, and then the, the vocational side of things, talk to me about that. Like you, you, talk, you mentioned college. So, mm -hmm. so now, now college isn't for everybody, but there's plenty of other opportunities employment wise that people you know, want to pursue. Um, I tell my own children that people laugh and they go, well, tell me you have four kids. Ha ha ha. Wait till college comes up. And I said, you know, I, I shake it off and I probably say something cute, but, but the point is, I don't know that all four of them will go to college. I don't know that all four of them should go to college, right? There's other things out there. I really think, you know, uh, my daughters are both becoming uh, pretty involved in, in music and things like that. And that'd be so awesome if that becomes their path. Um, but I don't make any determination saying people need to go to college. My point, in a long roundabout tangential Tommy D way is talk to me about education, how that rolls into um, the, uh, the employment, the vocational side of things. And, you know, let's maybe we'll talk about the store that's, uh, yeah. that's on campus. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So when I said the school, you know, a lot of those kids are geared towards college. Um, that's one segment of the population we serve and not all those kids go to college. We have some options for them now where um, there's the transition program they could go to called RAMP from 18 to 21. But as Tommy, you said, at 21, and this is across the United States, people with developmental disabilities um, and disabilities in general, basically get kicked out of the education system. And it's unfortunate because a lot of them could use a little bit more time and they're, they're still exploring options, but that's the way it works. That's where the funding just gets cut off and they have to move into an adult uh, sector. So that's through uh, OPWDD, and there's a bunch of acronyms here, but mm -hmm. there's different uh, funding streams and different services that they could uh, participate in after age 21. We provide a lot of those services. Uh, they are geared more towards employment, but seeing that the nature of disabilities changes, and it has changed in the past 15 years, there's a lot more people with very severe disabilities living longer, which is wonderful. It's a good problem. So having services for them past 21 became a, a huge part of our mission uh, a while back. And so we have a bridge program now for post-21. Those are a lot of people who uh, are not college bound and probably not employment bound at this time, but they're exploring some uh, at different educational options. Maybe they go to college, uh, you know, just to try out some classes and they go into different work sites, they go on field trips, they go into the community. Uh, that's a great new program that we started about a year and a half ago and it's been so successful. We have more and more interest every day. A lot of people will call it day have without walls. That's an industry term, mm -hmm. but that it's really, it's basically getting out there and seeing the world and, and exploring different options. So, Tell me about that. Like some of the things, where have they gone? What, what have they done in that bridge program? Because I'm thinking yeah. right away, like when we're allowed to be out and see people again, like I'm like, I, uh, we can, they, we can have those folks go over here and do this at like, uh, Shout out to Katie McGowan at Horseability. We can have them go visit over at Horseability, oh, yeah. right? Or they something. Could definitely take them to Horseability. Absolutely. That's right. Katie, so that's like Katie, right away. You. I'm like, my mind <laughs> yeah. is racing. Like, Katie, do you know Katie yeah. yet? I know Katie. Yeah. Katie, I love Katie. She's my we had, we had some of our Henry Scardi schools over, uh, the students over to Horseability a few times. And um, it's a, it's a, and it's a great program. We, I'm sure we work with them in other ways. So, um, the bridge program, that's one group. They've been to Good Morning America. They met Robin Roberts. I mean, I have wow. pictures of it. I, I've never met her. And My mother's going to be the, jealous uh, about that. She loves yeah, Robin Roberts. <laughs> yeah. Went and met her, took pictures with her. They awesome. went to uh, the headquarters of Etsy, which I didn't even know was in the area. I guess hmm. it is. And they went there. 
Um, yeah, we've taken them to corporations, to uh, you know, museums, and you know, to t TV shows. It's really anything goes. With the, it's really guided by them. What's great about this program is the students say, "I want to go here. Let's make it happen." And uh, if you see these kids, you'd wonder. You know, they're mostly nonverbal. A lot of them really can't speak without a communication device. Uh, some of them are not. You know, it's a mix of, of different people but they set the, um, the schedule. And I think that's incredible because it's all about self-determination. That's another industry term, but it's, um, it's a very big term right now. It's about people saying what they want. It's not about others dictating what they should do. Uh, and that's actually a good change that's happened in the last 10 years in the uh, developmental disabilities field, that it's now about what people themselves want and they have a voice of their own. So, you know, that's the empowerment piece that that's added into that program for sure. Well, that's what I was hearing as you said it. As you said self-determination, I said that goes in this, I'm writing notes and that goes in this empowerment column that, that we're talking mm -hmm. about for sure, um, which is what we need. You know, I talk a lot, a couple of uh, weeks ago, we had um, your friend of mine, Renee Flagler from Girls Inc. of Long Island. She uh, she made a visit up to the attic. Hey, Renee. Um, so, uh, <laughs> and she's, you know, they're all about um, helping um, young girls and uh, girls and young women be uh, strong, smart, and bold. And from an empowerment perspective, especially a father of two daughters, I have two sons as well, uh, but, but with my girls, it's like, I want to know how to best empower them to, to be though, just that, strong, smart, and bold, and, and super successful, and kind of not take any nonsense from anybody. And, and uh, I think it's human beings, it's what we, we all need. I said it before, you know, having somebody in your corner, having somebody looking out and telling you, you are freaking great. You have great abilities. Something earlier in this conversation when you were talking, you, you talked about how even when you were growing up and you were working with folks with disabilities, you said, I always love to, to connect with them and learn about their abilities. And that to me was, in, you know, that's the difference here. We all have different, challenges and we all have different abilities and i think it's critical for us to as we as much as we can not to make things to say things are so easy but to, to focus on where do you win where is your best ability where where's your uh you know it's cliche these days but your you know your superpower that whole thing we hear that a lot mm -hmm. you know um so yeah can i just share i want to share a quick funny story about that you know the original organization was named abilities that's what dr viscardi called it you know, to flip it yep. around from the negative disabilities to abilities. And in one of his books, uh, he wrote eight books, by the way, the second book gave us the tools. He had the factory all set up and he was trying to provide insurance for his employees and the insurance, and you should appreciate this, Tommy, the yep. insurance agent came, it was about health insurance. And he looked around and all the workers had disabilities, pretty severe physical disabilities. And he said, these people are not insurable. We cannot provide any insurance to these people. They are just too sick. And uh, he was very rude about it. And so Dr. Viscardi said to him, let me ask you a question. Can you pitch for the Yankees? And the guy said, no, of course not. I, I can't play baseball at all. So Dr. Viscardi said, that's your disability. I know. Now you have abilities, but you also have disabilities. So don't look at this group of people as having disabilities. See their abilities. I love that. And he, changed, love that. he changed the guy's mind and they, they got insurance. Oh, no kidding. So he really, so he closed him. Talk about sales. I love that. Yeah. But, oh, he was the greatest salesman ever. <laughs> uh, I'm, I, I regret that I never met him for sure because he seems yeah, like a really I do cool, too. Cool I guy. wish I had met him. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, it, it's like, um, I love that perspective, Lauren. I love what you just said there. Like it's because, wait, what a man, what a man to just say like, no, that's not right. That isn't how it works. Mm -hmm. You know, like, so I, I'm, I'm very inspired by. It was changing the perception. He had to change yeah. that guy's perception. 100%. And he did it with a lot of other people. I mean, I'm sure. I don't think our organization would be where it is today if he wasn't able to change a lot of minds. Again, I, he, he, service leader right i talk servant mm -hmm. leader i talk about that a lot yeah. that's that's just incredible um a whole generation of people have benefited from the work this man had done and it's it's mm -hmm. it's so it's so great didn't you tell me um when i came for the tour that um are his daughters or one of his daughters is still pretty involved uh yeah. with the viscardi center yeah, he had four daughters, and one of them, uh, the oldest, Nina, is on our school board, and then another daughter, uh, her son, um, is board. We have three boards, so we're actually a pretty large um, corporation of three different organizations, three boards, and then his 
great granddaughter <laughs> had a birthday um, about a year ago. I guess she was turning seven, I think. And instead of gifts, she asked for people to give to the Viscardi Center. And then she came by to drop off the money and got a tour, got to meet some of the kids her own age. And uh, we asked her at the end of the tour, you know, what do you think about the Henry Viscardi School? Do you see any differences? And, and she said, yeah, you guys have a school store and we don't. <laughs> and she's, she's in uh, Port Washington. She's in a very good district. Sure, but, uh, sure. you know, I love that the family uh, con tradition continues on and and they're all service minded people they're always giving back and that's why wouldn't they I'm be though doctor. right isn't that yeah. deal though why wouldn't they be when that's your dad and that's your grandfather and your great grandfather and just yeah. like you just like you are as a result of what your parents instilled in you um, i'll have to share this with my parents because i don't think i ever thank them for that <laughs> but thank you mom and dad <laughs> hey listen you know what i think this conversation is going to serve a lot of purposes but if it just serves that purpose then it was worth our time you know what I mean? I, I dig that. I'm glad you said it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's a great message, definitely. Uh, so talk to me about the store. We've kind of teased around it a little bit. Yeah. So I, I yeah. love that that piece of the of the uh, community as well. Yeah, it's really been a highlight on every tour. We have a Gap funded store, so it looks kind of like a Gap, uh, but we recently renamed it uh, Henry and Lucille's after our founder Henry Viscardi and his wife Lucille, and it's mostly a clothing store, but it serves as a retail training center. So um, one of the things we do with adolescents and adults with disabilities is really give them hands-on training so that they're more successful once they're employed. A lot of these individuals have never been employed. They're young and a lot of them are uh, just coming out of school. And uh, some of them are older and they're trying to reinvent themselves. Maybe they acquired a disability somehow. So we see a lot of that too. But this store is great because they spend a few months in the store actually serving real customers and uh, you know, using the cash register. The Gap comes in and provides them with uh, training and practice interviews and helps us keep our curriculum up to date. So it's great to have a corporation like the Gap. Um, I know everyone is you know, dealing with, with, uh, with issues right now uh, in the corporate world, but uh, the Gap, I felt, has always been very service-minded. So to spend time with our uh, participants quarterly it has been phenomenal. This has go been going on for over 10 years, probably longer. And then right across the way is actually a new program that Canon started. So Canon USA of the printers and copiers and, and cameras they started a very similar program right across the hall where they're training on their equipment and it's a four-week program with a fifth week about soft skills that's about you know interviewing and and handshakes and which who knows if that'll still exist but a lot of and we are actually looking at revamping the curriculum because we have those three training programs the third being culinary so training people to be in food service to be chefs to be kitchen workers um, we have to take a hard look now and see if if there's some pretty big changes that need to happen in our service delivery based on um, you know, the virus and, and making sure everyone stays safe. But prior to all this, I mean, we were so successful in uh, doing these hands-on training programs and then placing people into jobs. And we place about 150 people a year. See, that's incredible. Um, is, that's, I, yeah, I just wanna pause you one second because that's, that's incredible impact. These are, you're teaching these people uh, skills that they, they didn't have. Um, and and then they they're able to take and apply those skills to to go out to the workforce, which I think we all know this, and and you know probably people who would plug into a show like this are aware of it. But talk about empowerment when we have a job and we're doing something that's empowering them to itself. I mean, uh, just a quick um, quick hello to my friends at Best Buddies of uh, Best Buddies International, Best Buddies of New York. I, I sit on the um, uh, the state advisory committee and. Um, one of the major things, we had a friend of ours from Best Buddies um, come speak at the Bayside Business Association uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, this young man talked about what had happened when he was able to get employment um, and how his, his just, his self image changed, his, um, his happiness increased and how having, uh, you know, not only just making, doing a job and doing the thing and getting a paycheck, but the camaraderie. I mean, we're all feeling it right now. And I'm on a lot of Zoom calls like this and people are not, um, there's a lot of banter, water cooler stuff that goes on when you go to work. And, and you know, that is less likely when we're doing this virtual. 
unless you're me because I'm looking for it. So I'm like calling people okay. and texting. I'm like, let's just jump on Zoom. Like you called me the other last week and I was like, let's, can, yeah. can we just jump on Zoom because I want to see you. So, um, but I think right. so much of that community and so much of that, those connections and relationships that we develop are often developed in, in a work setting, in a business setting. So I think uh, there's so many different levels to, to benefit um, somebody by, by empowering them to, to learn a skill, to learn a trade and then, and then work it. Um, I remember when I came by and visited, I was definitely there for a second time. Um, I don't remember what, oh, maybe it was, uh, I don't remember. I've been health, there and business, health and Business Alliance, is that it what was, it's called? We were there for the HBA, and then I've been there yeah. so many times because we did a breakfast meeting. Uh, we did the one of our nonprofit executive leadership roundtables. Right. We had we had my friend, uh, Alan You're Cohen, just looking come looking for in. excuses to, to come and visit. Whatever, man. <laughs> I, I don't, but yeah, for, that was great. That was a great day. Uh, that was a great presentation, so... Well, yeah, yeah we, we had a lot of have, fun. We have the space. People can come to our space and rent it um, or, you know, partnerships. Uh, sometimes we give it away, but for the most part, we have this great conference space and it's fully accessible to, for wheelchairs. And it also has state-of-the-art um, video and web, WebEx and webinar capabilities. So yeah, we've used the space several the times. Future. Yeah, well, that's important. And uh, I'm going to show, I want to show the company website. Um, but while we're doing that, why don't you tell people how to get in touch with you um, if they, you know, if they have interest in learning more about the organization and or potential partnerships and things like that. Sure. Well, my email is pretty simple. It's lmarzo, L-M-A-R-Z-O, at biscardicenter.org. So there's our website. And um, you could probably find my information somewhere on the website, too. But see, biscardicenter.org. So you just do lmarzo at biscardicenter.org. And uh, you could sign up for emails here. You could click on Facebook, Twitter, uh, all of those things and check out, you know, we have YouTube, we have amazing videos. I mean, our videos are in this kind of downtime when you can't go anywhere. Uh, I definitely invite you to check out our YouTube channel. We have just, you know, that's really where our mission can come alive when you're not there in person. Yeah, which is what we have to see right now. And I was playing around on the website early this oh, morning. Yeah, Sonny. And I saw Sonny and I was like, I've never met Sonny. Yeah. And I was like, oh, look at Sunny. Yeah, I wanted to talk about Sunny a little bit today because cool. one of the best stories that's happened over the past year that always puts a smile on my face is we've been working with the Guide Dog Foundation and John Miller and John his Miller, great sure. team over there. Yeah, amazing organization. I think I'm saying amazing way too much, by the way, but <laughs> I, I, I get very passionate. I get very excited about- hey, Try to use, um, um, you know, use these terrific ones. if you want or fantastic. Terrific, fan yeah. <laughs> I need a thesaurus in front of me at all times. <laughs> but um, so uh, John Miller and our CEO, John Kemp, became uh, good friends and started to kind of cook up an idea, which ended up being really incredible. So they had this uh, puppy, puppy with a purpose on the Today Show. And uh, you might actually find some of those Today Show videos on our YouTube channel too. But oh, actually, there's a there's a link there where you can right. click on Sunny's farewell segment on today. So Sunny was great friends with Al Roker and Carson Daly and all kinds of celebrities. I mean, he was a little celebrity himself. And what happened was when he grew up and it was time for him to be placed with either a veteran or a person with a disability, they found out he had too many allergies and he would mm -hmm. need a lot of extra care, which. Uh, which would be too much of a burden for, for one person. So John Miller and John Kemp kind of decided, you know, maybe this is an opportunity for the Viscardi Center and school to have a facility dog. And you can see Sonny there, he is such a well-behaved, helpful, therapeutic, uh, friendly face that the kids get to see every morning when they come in. And throughout the day, he's helping them with their therapies. He's helping so he them- lives at, He lives at the Viscardi Center? Well, on a daily, he's, he comes to work at the Viscardi Center, just like I do, and then he goes home, <laughs> just, like, just like we do. I don't live there either, but Sonny, uh, we, right, but he's we a found dog. I thought I thought he's maybe he would live there because he was a dog. I didn't, I, yeah. I know you don't, I, I well, assume you don't live there. <laughs> no, but, uh, but you know, he's there going to work just like we all do. He's wearing that little service vest, that's guide dog vest. And um, when he takes it off at night, when he goes home, uh, he turns into a regular dog. It's like magic. <laughs> so his handler is actually um, our instructional technologist. So she was already on staff and also happened to be uh, <coughs> a big dog person and great with dogs. So she took him on and he lives with Dina. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, from this kind of uh, school from home situation that we're in, Sonny actually still does his job. He oh, wow. helps the kids with their, uh, with their learning, um, help them get through kind of anxious situations. He, um, he helps them with their therapies. He's sort of a motivator. So he's therapeutic, but he motivates. There's this one girl, Adriana, who really fell in love with Sonny immediately. She was having trouble. She, she's in a, um, a manual wheelchair, so she has to push herself. And that's tough, you know, for any, anyone of a young age. And Sunny motivated her to go faster, go longer, and she developed a lot more strength. And I thought that was just a, that's a great story right there. Of course, but, uh, that's Sunny, incredibly Sunny's inspirational. Been, um, yeah, and, and because of uh, this wonderful partnership with the Guide Dog Foundation, and you know this, they are up for two Imagine Awards. Mm -hmm. um, uh, John Miller himself for his leadership and for the organization for this wonderful, innovative partnership. Uh, this has never been done before, at least in this area and with our organizations. Uh, it's, a, it's a great example of how um, two kind of completely different organizations can partner and really help each other out. So two quick things. One point, first of all, you know I'm all about collaborations and strategic alliances and partnerships. So I always dig when I hear those stories big time. So uh, John Miller is, is uh, you can, John Miller is everywhere, you know. So yeah. hey, John. Uh, He's great at <laughs> he, he, that's great. And uh, since you brought it up, you know, um, you know, uh, hugs out to uh, Ken Serini, Serini and Associates and everybody at the, on the team with uh, the Long Island Imagine Awards. Uh, July 8th will be the awards uh, program in a virtual format. Uh, text me or email me or just find me and I'll share that information. But you can just Google Long Island Imagine Awards and the upcoming New York City Imagine Awards is, uh, is in March of next year. Um, the event will be March of next year. I, I'm, because I'm super curious and because I'm sure there's other people that are curious and I didn't want to ask you later, I'll just ask you right now, where is Sunny Lake standing? Like, is that on the cement outside and, and did they put that paw print and everything or is that like a rug or no. what, is, what is that? No, we actually, our mascot is a cougar and that's a cougar paw oh, so it's print. A paw. I mean, it's okay. without the claws. It's a, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a paw. Uh, and that's right when you enter our main door of the school. So it's literally like you step in and there's this huge kind of rug with, it says Henry Viscardi and it has the paw print on it. So it's a great place for pictures. It's perfect for, but it's mm -hmm. perfect to put a puppy. Like I thought that yeah. was, uh, you know, like a, a big paw of Sonny's or something like that. So I know. And he, he kind of sits right near that area. So as kids come in every day, he's greeting them. Hello. And that, so that's kind of in, his main you area. You see a dog that starts your day. You get, it's not going to just change your state, right? Like it's all about like that would, if I get to see that beautiful puppy face every day, I'd be, I'd be totally, yeah. I mean, no, I'm pretty happy he, most he times anyway, a, he but. He does a fist bump and yeah, he no, does he all these different things. What do you mean he does you know? a fist? He, he just, he like, just puts um, a. So with his nose and your <laughs> fist, he does a fist bump. It's the cutest thing. How and long has he been there? Because I haven't uh, met him. Yeah, June, uh, June 26, I believe was the date that the Today Show sort of handed him over to us. So that video that's right on that page, it was, um, it was live and the kids were watching and finding out live that they were getting this facility done, oh, wow. um, which we didn't get to show that side of it, but um, it's pretty incredible. Like the kids were beyond words. They were so excited. And That's awesome. so I think he started working for us last summer pretty much, but when the fall, you know, we have about half the students in the summer. And then when the fall started, we had 170 kids greeting Sunny every day and it's, it's been incredible and I'm sure they miss him and actually oh, that's what we've been hearing that that's the thing they miss the most they miss seeing Sonny <laughs> well two things first of all uh the first thing is, is serious and the second thing is me trying to be cute and funny uh so that the, the first thing is um maybe you should do some videos with with Sonny you know if you're saying he's already interacting with the kids maybe just like what if you did what's Sonny doing today like sort of like I go hashtag where's Tommy D like hashtag what's Sonny doing today? And then every day you just have one video. Dina maybe could do a video of like Sonny doing whatever, playing in the yard or, or um, something yeah, silly, watching TV. I, I think you should I'm do sure that. She'd love doing that. Yeah. And the second thing is how come what Sonny didn't come on the show with us today? That's the funny one. Like I would have loved yeah. to have had Sonny well, with us. Well, I could us. go get my dog, but my <laughs> dog is not well-trained. Well, well, <laughs> so you, know you don't want to I got enough cute. humans over here at my house that are not yeah. that well trained, so so I get it. Which is like a funny thing. Like um, my kids want a dog so bad, and um, mm -hmm. um, up until you know, up until we've been stranded here, I've uh, I was never really home during the day for hours. You know, twelve, thirteen hour days outside on the road uh, working, 
And uh, there was no way we could do that. I couldn't put my wife through that to have four little kids and a dog. And I'm not really here to help out with any of that. So, um, you know, it's better for our relationship by not having a dog here. <laughs> Cause I, That's what get... we did for a while. We, we kept saying, oh, we're never home, we're never home. But now we're always home. And it is great yeah. to have a dog during these times. I, you might've seen this, help. some of the nonprofits and like the kennels and stuff like that, like uh, North Shore Animal Leagues and, and places like that, they don't have any dogs left. People are yeah, adopting dogs and cats and it's stuff great. like that, like crazy, which yeah. is awesome, which is, you know, so cool because- uh, That's one of the positive outcomes here. We're always looking for the positives, right? You so. know, we totally are. And I had, uh, I had Beth, you know, our friend Beth Buckheister on the show from Career Day Inc. Uh, maybe two weeks ago. And we were talking about, you know, something really challenging in her life. And, and we were just trying to say, you know, not that we want to say like, hey, well, that's great that coronavirus happened. And then this is the benefit of that, because that's not, we, none of us think it's great that coronavirus happened, COVID-19, nobody's reporting that. But if you think of things and you say, because of that, here's what came out of that. Because of that experience that we had, here's a, a major benefit um, it still sounds strange when I say a major benefit of, of a global pandemic, but the, the reality of it is, is, is there's great things that are going on in the world. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, listen, I, I can't get over looking at Sony. That's a, that just the whole thing is so cool. Um, oh, yeah. Talk to me about Sony this because the there, there's other event or there's other on this page, it says events, which is something I really want to talk about. And you and I spent like 90 seconds together because before we turned on the video, because I want to get the video on as soon as possible because I think all the funny stuff is good to get uh, on the recording. So I said to you, um, we talked about pivoting, and I can't tell you if there's a word that drives me crazier than pivot these yeah, days. I wish but, I had a nickel for every time right? I heard that word. I wish I owned the word, no doubt. I mean, as a I fundraiser, like, give me some money for using that word. <laughs> for using the word pivot, I don't know who like owns overused. it. So I feel like I I'm in. I feel like I'm in sixth grade. Sixth grade CYL basketball, and I'm like pivoting, yeah, pivot, like you know, pivot. that's all I'm thinking, yeah. right? So, um, mm. but but that obviously is not exactly what people mean. They mean, what have you had to do from a development perspective, from an event perspective? I mean, we all jumped on a call a couple of weeks back and kind of had like a what we call the fireside chat to to really engage with uh, with each other in the sector here on Long Island. So we got a lot of information from all the groups, but. What have you had to do? Cancel, um, postpone, you know, how have you had to do things? Even if you want to talk specifics about development and how you've, you know, done development while this is going on. I'm going to actually shut Sonny off so we can go back to big screen, you and me, while, uh, while we talk about it. And, I you know, like I'm in Long small, Island. Though. I'd rather see Sonny you, than me. You want to see Sonny? All right, fine. Then <laughs> no, we'll leave Sonny. Okay. All right, good. I was well, just about if to... you leave the page up, you could see the event dates. So sure. I don't have to get too into that, but I'll talk about, you know, this, this has been very challenging uh, for fundraisers. And I think that goes across the board. Every fundraiser I've spoken to, uh, everyone in the nonprofit world is dealing with a shortfall in funding right now from any source. I mean, it could be government, it could be, uh, you know, their donor base, um, it could be lack of, you know, there's just no revenue coming in for their programs uh, or they can't operate their programs. So it's been a real challenge in the nonprofit world. Uh, I'm hoping that we see some more relief rather than just getting the, the PPP loans through the CARES Act. There's a, there should be other ways that the nonprofit world can get through this. Um, and I know that there are a lot of donors out there who are still providing support. So I want to thank all of them. If, if you're listening, if anyone out there listening has made donations to their favorite nonprofits, thank you. We need it now more than thank ever. You. Uh, yes, it's, uh, we've been blessed that there are some really great donors that are, are still supporting the Viscardi Center. But what we're doing right now is just staying in touch. Um, and the events can't happen right now. Everyone knows that. So it's about personal phone calls. It's about calls like this. It's any way that a person wants to stay in touch. You kind of be, have to meet them on their terms. You know, if they don't want to do a Zoom, don't do a Zoom. If they want to, you know, just like a weekly check-in or a bi-weekly check-in, uh, that's what I'm doing with our donors, and I think it goes a long way. They've appreciated the calls. They've appreciated having just a, a friendly person to talk to and, and share their stories with. Uh, everyone's going through different things right now, so it's really just staying connected with the donors in any way possible. Uh, we also have a pretty robust communications plan, uh, which is including <coughs> weekly or, uh, you know, emails twice a week sometimes and daily social media posts. So all of that goes a long way too. People are checking in a lot more on social media. 
And uh, we're just, you know, trying to make sure that people are aware of, of where we're heading too. It's not just about the here and now, it's about what's coming up. And we don't have all the answers, but uh, we do have a few events that we still have on the calendar. You could see here, we are definitely not doing, I think that um, mental health, mental wellness thing must be more of a webinar at this point. We do a lot of webinars, mm -hmm. we're already doing that. And we do a lot on uh, employment uh, issues like staying healthy in the workplace, mental wellness in the workplace, disclosing your disability in the workplace. So we, we can continue still having all those webinars, which is wonderful. Um, but as far as fundraising events, we have four big ones and uh, Celebrity Sports Night being our biggest, that was canceled. That would have been next week. Uh, and you could see it there. It's scheduled for next year, May 20th. Um, that would, that's when it would have been anyway. So we're skipping it for a whole year and that's really yeah. challenging. That, yeah, that's, there's a lot of, that's a lot of organizations are, are at that point yeah. where it's like, you know, because it's how far do you push something out? Mm -hmm. Because if you push this, let's just say we're back and, and running by October, November, now you're going to hit those same kind of folks again in May for the same type of event. And you sort of right. say like, well, what, how, we, we space well, it out a year I mean. because, because we space it out a year. When we don't, then it, it changes the, the dynamic of that. Exactly. That's why we didn't decide to have it in November, you know, any time in the fall. Because, and we had a very long discussion at a I'm board sure. meeting about this. This was mm -hmm. not an easy decision. I mean, we're now missing out on hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue right. from that event. Yep. But uh, I mean, there's still donors contributing. So, you know, we're going to, we'll be okay in the short term, but uh, I'm really hopeful that we could have that event next year. And, you know, Tommy, you know, we're, we're forming a task force to make sure that we could reinvent this event mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. reimagine it to use this time wisely. And I would say this for any nonprofit, since you have a little bit of time right now to kind of strategize and put some new fresh thought into what you're doing. This could go for events, this, this could go for your programs, anything you're doing. Um, I know we're all busy day to day, but this is still a good time to kind of stop and think about how things can look differently going forward because I think everything's gonna change. Uh, I said before, we may not have handshakes. I, no. I don't know. I mean, I, I, know. I would hate to think we're not handshaking anymore, but we may not you know, be in a crowded space for quite some time. So even your programs, how are you gonna operate your programs in this new normal? So all of those you know, thoughts have to go in uh, to your future planning right now. That's really the time, you know, as much as you can plan. Uh, we do have the golf outing and Reach for a Star Luncheon plan. The Reach for a Star Luncheon is actually a postponed date. That's not the original date. So mm -hmm. we're, we're very hopeful, very hopeful that we could still have it on October 15th. But, you know, we have to play it by ear. We're really staying That's the on problem, top of- right? Isn't that, isn't that the challenge? No, like, yep. you know, even, even and forget about partisanship and, and forget about the politics of the whole thing. Uh, I, I just think we don't know. Nobody knows. It's not like, all right, well, that thing that was keeping us home ended. Now we can just turn the, the lights back on and go back to work and go back to doing what we're doing. It, it's not like that. There's so much, no. uh, I, there's so much uncertainty which is the biggest challenge I think that we're all going through aside from people getting sick. It's just like, I think to your point earlier, like, you know, I remember six, seven weeks ago, eight weeks ago, maybe when we were saying things like, well, you can't do that now. You can't ask for donations now, or you can't be selling or you can't have, but I, I don't, we're not there anymore. I've been on some webinars uh, specifically with um, different organizations that are, like resources to the nonprofit sector. And I was on one on like a Facebook Live like a week, maybe last week, I think it was. And it was just a bunch of, of development folks like and, and consultants, like outside consultants saying, no, you have to be connecting with your donor base right now. You have to be having these conversations because again, now we're two months into this. It's like, this is the new normal. We keep talking about what is gonna be the new normal or no, this is it. Like this, this is now. We're still conducting ourselves in, in business and or in service nonprofits. We have to live. We have to do things that we would have done differently, yes, but we still have to do the things, you know. Um, so I think, you know, just uh, the, the word that keeps coming up for me is is the uncertainty of the whole thing. We haven't, we can't say you, you know, and, and you or me as much as we want and, and uh, you know, together, you know, we've been on some calls with, with the Imagine Awards because you and I are both uh, committee members over there. It's been like, you know, even calls like that were, were in your your board conversation and my conversation with my business associates. It's like 
you know, well, it'll be good because, you know, by June we'll be, no, we won't. We don't know. July we will. August. I don't know. I don't know. So yeah, that is the worst part, not knowing. It's really hard to plan. It's very mm -hmm. hard to plan. Um, but I, but I think there is that kind of change right now. I, it's always been about connecting with donors, but at the very beginning, it was don't ask for money right now. That would be unwise and uh, disrespectful. But I do see that it's starting to shift back to no, you you do have to ask, but still be very sensitive, very respectful, um, kind of. You know, I think, let me see if I wrote this down. I was on a great webinar last week where um, the speaker said that what you have to do with your donors is when you're checking in, first understand their situation. Um, you know, kind of hear what they're going through. Um, and then next, tell them what's going on with your organization. So share your story and, and the challenges that you're facing. And then, and this is kind of just a different way of doing it. You know, normally, you know, development professionals know how to ask for a gift, but in these times, this person suggested that you have to ask the donor if you can ask. Wow. So that's probably just a new script, a new way of asking for support. So it's sort of just putting it on the table. You know, I'd like to talk to you about giving, but I'd like to know if I can talk to you about that. So I wrote that down because I, you know, I write down these nuggets of wisdom yeah, of when, I, when I get them. Yeah. And I, it just, it kind of flipped the switch for me because I'm very comfortable asking for support, but this has been such a challenging time to do that because you don't want to offend anyone. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, a lot of our donors have been very clear with me. Their uh, portfolio tanked. It's mm -hmm. coming back up now, but it tanked at the beginning. Uh, or they're in a business that is having major, major deficits right now, like, you know, retail, um, you know, like assisted living, you know, where there's just, uh, the crisis is huge for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to ask those donors for money unless it feels like they're ready to have that conversation. So ask them if, if you could have that conversation. I thought that was a really that's an, good that's way to look at it. That's an incredible, incredible takeaway. And I think people will benefit from from getting just that because like at the end of the day there you know like you said you're a professional development person this is what you do you know how to have these conversations but you know how to have these conversations prior to what we're living through now so we have to change and evolve and and our language has to change and evolve and um and that's that's critical i'm gonna when i share this on social media is i wrote down those three points because i think that's something that people need to be aware of you know development people i mean listen we we had you and, and our friend uh, Linda Berman at um, at the nonprofit uh, executive yeah. leadership roundtables. What's up, Linda? <laughs> Corporate source, Thanks, love Linda. you guys. Um, yeah, she's the best. So you guys did like an incredible job from a development perspective. And what's coming to me right now, and I'm, I'm just gonna say it is, I wonder if it makes sense to put together, you know, um, sort of a quasi like we did fireside chat, but just for some development people because how. You know, we can bring in a consultant always and, and have somebody talk about it from a, you know, from a different perspective. But what about what you guys are living each day in the trenches? So I'm putting that out to you. I'm wondering if you want to do it. You and me, we set up a call and we'll put it out to any development people and we'll just simply meet on Zoom. And, you know, I will, like I say, I try to I'll just get out of the way. I just want to be there to kind of, I get a little gravitas. People follow me a little bit. So we, I want to be there to help put them at the table. And then, but really have you guys have an open dialogue. What do you think of something like that? Yeah, I think it's great. I love that fireside chat you did a few weeks ago and I was glad to be able to join for a little bit. And uh, I saw some great people on that. And if it's the same people or <clears throat> some new people that haven't been joining, I think it's great. I think we all have something to share. We've all been going through this in different ways and we're learning as we go. And I would rather be sharing right now than, um, than keeping this information to myself. I, I really think that this is the time to collaborate and not compete. There is no room for competition right now. We're all in this together. 100%, 100%. I think that goes at all levels. I think it goes in business, it goes in family, I mean, and, and certainly in our sector, in nonprofits. Um, so we're, well, you heard it here first, folks. The, it's, uh, we've decided here in the attic that we will be doing another fireside chat. So uh, I'm, uh, it'll be Lauren and I, and hopefully other people will be there too, but I'm sure there will be. Um, what about, where do you, you know, you have two minutes, let's say, in front of an executive leader of a company, um, you have an opportunity to tell the story and, you know, in a compelling way, uh, get somebody enthusiastic about the family of nonprofits here from through the Briscardi Center. 
what's your, let's just do it. I've, we've not done it this way before, but what's the pitch? How do you tell the story? And, and what do you want somebody to, to walk away with? Wow. I mean, I, two minutes is never enough for me, but, uh, what I, if I, if I only get, if it's an elevator pitch, I only yeah. have those two minutes. Um, well, I, I really try, first of all, if I know who they are and what their business is, I try to kind of grab them uh, using that as a, as a background, like knowing that what they might be interested in. And since we do so many things at Viscardi, uh, if it's kids that grab them, if it's, um, you know, jobs and, and uh, education, employment, whatever it is, I try to grab them. So I would say the general pitch though, is that um, we are uh, a disability organization providing education, employment, empowerment to 2000 people a year on Long Island and nationwide. We also have some international programs. And what we do is really try to find the best path for an individual to have the most successful life. That's what we all want. So that's what I think grabs most people that they could all relate to that, that it's all about finding your path and finding your potential. And we've all been through this growing up, you know, going to college, trying to find our first job. So I think most people just relate to the human aspect of the Viscardi Center. It's about people. It's about people seeking the best possible life, which is what we all want. It's all we want, right? It's, um, you know, in, in business, I just try to say, you know, they're just, that's just another person trying to get through their day, do what they can to grow, do what they can to take care of their family. Um, and that's, that's, that was a great message. Um, I put you on a spot, but I knew I could count on you for that one. Um, I, well, I do elevator pitches every day, but um, I was going to say, you know, this is what I'm we do, right? Rusty. We should know, feel, we should know our yeah, business, I know. right? <laughs> I feel a little because I'm not in face to face with people these days. And I, I mean, I've done tons of these things, but it's, uh, the elevator pitch is mm. always in person. I've never done an elevator pitch over a so, video call. So unfortunately, that's all we got these days, right? So um, yeah. I will, I'll share, um, I'll share. So one of my mentors, a very good friend of mine, uh, Michael Goldberg, uh, trains uh, people on networking and uh, does a lot of work in the financial field. And we actually together, uh, he founded uh, TNG, the networking group. And I work very close him, closely with him on that project. And he has this thing called um, the peace statement, P-E-E-C. So it's your profession, your expertise, the environments, and your call to action. And it's really a nice way to, to consolidate that all. Um, we can always talk about it another time. But, um, you know, your profession is just that, what you do, right? And it's your expertise is in these areas. And usually we try to hit like in three bullet points. And then your environments is who you're really serving. And your call to action is just like it sounds like what, what you're looking for. So it's something that you can use for, from an elevator pitch perspective, but it also becomes almost like a marketing plan. Because once you have hit upon all those things, it's like, well, that's what I do. That's how I go to market. That's, that's the information um, that people need to know about you. So look, I knew that you and I were going to have a fun time this morning. Um, we could probably keep talking for another hour, um, but I want people to... Uh, to realize that what this show is all about is telling the story, uh, driving home the importance of the mission, driving home how the constituents are being served um, in a uh, story-like setting, but in a succinct and, and, um, and compact setting as well. So I think if we hit upon most of those. And what's fun about me is that you can come back anytime, especially while I'm locked away in the attic. So we could do this again sometime soon when you know, when you have something specific about an event that is coming up and we're talking about that, um, or if you just want to, if you just want to come back and, and drop some development knowledge on the community, um, we can do, we'll do stuff like that. Um, so it's always so fun hanging out with you, Lauren. I appreciate you coming on the show. Lastly, I just want you to, to say, how do people get in touch with you and learn more about Viscardi? Let's do that one more time. Okay. So viscardicenter.org. And then my oh. email is L Marzo. Spell it V I. Yeah, I think we better. <laughs> v I S C A R D I Center C E N T E R dot org. And my email is L Marzo. So L M A R Z O at Viscardi Center dot org. Awesome, thank you. And, and we, we're probably the only Viscardi. So if you just Google Viscardi. Yeah, like, that's right. Yeah, there's that whole thing. Isn't that all we do anyway? Yeah. That's what that's what people yeah. are going to do. They're going to start typing the Google. And, and, Google's going to yeah, finish the spelling. Um, yeah, check out our uh, 
our social media pages um, because you'll see more pictures of Sunny and the kids and everything we're doing, uh, especially our YouTube. And I think that actually is Abilities Viscardi. So okay. if you if you go into YouTube and type Abilities Viscardi, I think that's how you find us. So um, I I watch those videos uh, almost every day because it always gets me just feeling a lot better about everything. It's they're very uplifting, very positive. I'm sure I, I'm actually, as soon as we hang up, I'm gonna hang up, as soon as we finish, I'm gonna go subscribe to all of the social media. Um, and this has been another uh, incredibly inspiring, incredibly fun episode of what we like to call philanthropy in focus, uh, being broadcast and recorded from my attic. Um, so thanks Lauren for coming up to the attic. It's awesome to see you. And I mean that see you like this. Um, yeah. Have an awesome, incredible day. And I will talk to you soon. Thanks everybody. Take right. care. Thank you, All Tommy. Right, You're welcome. Bye. Bye.